Alexi Leiforov yeah. and your colleague Maria, and I'm going to mess up your name, Mirochenko yeah. <laughs> is also here with you. So please go ahead and give them a warm welcome. Okay, so yeah, thanks. I just wanted to start in English for those who's English speaking, that all the slides are in both languages, and except for the videos, but they are more like, you know, just videos. Uh, and the rest I'm going to talk in Russian. First of all, I would like to say that you have to be looking forward to something entirely different from what we have been talking before. Uh, VOD is what we do. Uh, number one, that's uh, something that makes us different. Number two is our coverage is very different because we are a TV channel. Uh, our audience is 9 million people, double the population of Denmark. Our channel broadcasts to um, the um, whole of CIS plus Ukraine, which is no longer CIS. And uh, 19 months ago, uh, we also did broadcasting to the Baltic countries, but uh, we gave up on this idea because uh, generally, the rights for the northern region are bought by, say, non-stop entertainment company. Uh, and uh, for um, to work with Baltic countries, we will have we, uh, we would have to buy uh, rights from them and pay double, uh, which is something that we uh, didn't want to do. I hope that you can see it nicely. 24 Doc is a TV channel and an online platform, VOD, Video On Demand. It's a platform in the making. Uh, it's a work in, the, uh, in progress. And uh, we also position ourselves as a cinema brand because we also buy uh, uh, screening rights for films cinema rights. Let us watch our trailer. That's what that's it is. 24 Dog presents exciting provocative sexy Sensational. It's the best documentaries on one channel. 24 Dog. This is the third incarnation of our channel uh, because we uh, did a relaunch in 2014. Our previous concept was a bit more reactional and more politicized, uh, with a huge um, accent on uh, Russian documentaries and Russian documentaries only. This concept proved ineffective because the uh, TV channel is a slightly different format. And I have been in documentaries for um, seven years. My first festival was Doc that took place in Moscow and certain and several regional centers. Since then, documentary um, filming and films have changed. The funding systems have changed. The distribution systems have also changed. Our Danish uh, colleagues mentioned that in 2010, um, so the the, the uh, films for our Danish uh, from our Danish colleagues uh, for our 2010 festival could be got free of charge. Uh, now it's not the case. The festival is one of the um, options for um, uh, for uh, screening, and many uh, companies actually charge for being screened at festivals. And huge corporations like Netflix. Uh, uh, get 
uh, can sometimes screen um, uh, s several films for uh, the festivals, be it Toronto, be it Ven uh, Venice. And what we see is different platforms, powerful platforms, including HBO. When we were relaunching our TV channel, we decided to build on the mediums that we were using. We are a TV channel. Uh, this relaunch was made necessary by a kind of identity crisis because uh, we found ourselves part of a large company, Digital TV, and it had many departments, many units. Uh, one was educational, the other uh, more um, entertaining. And uh, hence the uh, and here's the documentary cinema. What is it? Is it educational or is it entertaining? Do we separate? Uh, do we need to separate uh, uh, feature films from documentary films? And these questions, um, it's uh, it's very strange that nobody asked these questions during this conference. Uh, I think that it's a slightly uh, industrialized, so, so to say, story. The um, We used all of this to uh, all of these ideas to uh, build our channel. Our official voice uh, presenter Andrei Gavrilov. We selected him specifically because in the 1990s uh, he um, uh, he was the voice for a practically all bootleg uh, pirated videos ever released in Russia. So uh, for people um, of my generation, this is the voice associated with cinema, with films. And it was a matter of principle that um, all our videos uh, have his voice on, because they're immediately associated with cinema. Uh, his voice is immediately associated with cinema. Uh, we are um, an educational channel. It was. Um, it's. It would be difficult for us to compete with feature films because. Uh, and, and also, uh, we had this problem because most cable uh, channels are thematically organized, are subject based. Um, and documentary, cine uh, documentary films are so very diverse. They can be experimental, they can be pure journalism. So our marketing strategy, and hence the name of my presentation. Uh, so the title of um, uh, my presentation says film programming as a marketing strategy, but um, I was thinking about editorial policies. Uh, we um, uh, were thinking about the stigma that surrounds documentary films because they are not the easiest things to promote. And we work with a 9 million audience that have access to our channel. So we can't afford to uh, dictate uh, anything to them. We need to integrate them in our context. So our marketing and uh, programming um, policy is based on film quality, and we also try to promote films at different levels. Um, several months ago, we created a series of videos where uh, we showcased uh, different uh, films and, uh, that we um, show on our channel, classifying them by emotion. What can a viewer experience? What kind of emotions can our viewers experience once they watch our films? Wow. 
fashion. Fear. Freedom. Love. Rage. Let me get back to my previous statement. Our strategy was to promote specific films. And very frequently, films, even on TV, can be presented in a very refreshing way. So um, it was important for us to let our viewers know that our content was high quality one. One of the possibilities, uh, one of the strategies to do that was to involve partners to work in symbiosis. When we um, offer their content and they help us to uh, integrate their brand into our channel by means of joint projects. We have a very diverse um, audience, it's half women, half men, and uh, uh, we um, uh, invited the, uh, the fashion magazine Vogue to uh, uh, work with us and we even uh, created the first Monday in May film that opened the uh, festival in Quebec this year. It was produced by Contenast. And the story shows that documentary films are in demand, uh, in demand and uh, there is a ready market for documentary, cinema, uh, for documentary films among uh, brands, among different venues. And uh, if uh, we look at the situation in the social media, which we watch, uh, very carefully, uh, we have um, about uh, 55,000 um, subscribers uh, on Facebook, 20 on uh, Contacte, which is a Russian social medium. Uh, social media are very promising resources for uh, documentary promotion. And in some cases, uh, some uh, 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 in some uh, cases, uh, the social media gave us surprises. For example, Wolfpack, uh, a film uh, about uh, a family of um, uh, a family with uh, brothers, teenage brothers, who spent most of their uh, life locked up, and the only um, uh, the only window on reality um, uh, were films they actually uh, re uh, replicated and reenacted uh, motion pictures by Tarantino in their flat, and uh, the Russian viewers were quite receptive. There were. Uh, this is a thing that might seem a bit risque for a wide audience, but um, if you analyze the social media, it's not. And uh, also I was uh, uh, enchanted by uh, uh, Jiro's Dreams of Sushi uh, and the impact that it had on our viewers. Every time we post a trailer for this film, uh, we get uh, around 30,000 views, viewings. All of the partners that I mentioned, uh, we did a major project with Squire magazine, uh, with Magnum, a photographic agency. Uh, 
because our audiences are the same. Uh, the Russian Squire did um, a large publication, d uh, did a large um, uh, material about Magnum. Strelka is our other uh, long-standing partner. We presented uh, their project on uh, our venue. I will, uh, however, I will talk about these partnerships a bit later. Also, we try to diversify as best we can. Uh, we sometimes adhere to very classical models, uh, and uh, we started with uh, with the Snowden uh, films, The Truth About Snowden. Um, uh, and when Guardian uh, published the list of uh, the most influential Muscovites, um, uh, certain uh, Muscovites, uh, the most powerful ones, uh, Guardian included Snowden on this list. So our views, uh, the global view and the Russian view on Snowden might sometimes be different. And uh, by the way, this was one of the, the film was one of the reasons why we decided not to show two politicized films, because in our previous uh, version of the channel, we had three films about rapes in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Central Asia, in Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, the Russian viewers do not have the culture uh, for consuming these topics. There is no context uh, for talking about these things constructively, for discussing them constructively. So when you're showing a political motion picture, uh, it's, um, for example, if it's not of the level of Susan Four. Um, you will end up being populist, and uh, this isn't what we would like to do. So we gave up on that. Eventually, this model started shifting. In Russia, we have a, a cinema chain called Karo Film. It's a major company. I think uh, they have the third largest number of screens. Uh, among the companies operating in Russia, cinema companies operating in Russia. They opened a festival of experimental uh, movies last week. And this chain enables you to distribute your film in uh, about 20 citizen towns across Russia. And they will do, they will copy. Uh, the film and uh, themselves, and uh, you uh, won't have to bear huge logistical expenses. It's fairly affordable. So, uh, so uh, nowadays we live in a situation when you have to contact just one company to organize screenings in 20 cities, which is good, which is exciting. Um, Another uh, field of work uh, of our channel is festival activities. Uh, we mentioned Domain, a film by Melanie Laran, best, most famous uh, for her appearance in Quentin Tarantino's uh, movie, uh, the, uh, the Bastards. Uh, uh, so the film received uh, a César for being the best documentary, and it became a box office hit in Belgium and Switzerland. So this is uh, this is a picture. This is a movie that uh, we um, will be exposing to the Russian viewers. Uh, we sent it to uh, the Message to, uh, to Man Festival, and we're going to show it in Ekaterinburg um, uh, at the Russia, Russia Festival, um, creating a precedent because uh, the uh, latter festival uh, focuses on Russian movies. We collaborate with six festivals in total. Our key venue is the Moscow uh, International Festival, uh, and I'm a member of the selection committee on that festival, of that festival. 
there are some premier slots offered. Uh, and uh, we do it without screening fees. Uh, we give the subtitles uh, films to uh, festivals free of charge because it's important for us to um, distribute, to disseminate uh, documentaries in the regions and to contribute to uh, making it happen. Flyho Tiana, uh, we also, uh, as far as Flyho Tiana is concerned, we provide consultancy services regarding uh, Joshua Pinheimer's um, uh, recent film. Plus, we will be running a small project in the intellectual uh, um, uh, intellectual literature fair called Nonfiction. Uh, this is uh, the shot from the film Tomorrow, which will be shown during the festival. Now about our online cinema. I have a small video to promote this project. TV Channel 24 Doc presents exciting stories, unforgettable feelings, secret details, Enchanting pictures, celebrity figures, the best documentaries uh, anytime on any device, online cinema, 24 talk. Getting back to um, the importance of the medium of the format. At present, we cannot offer a very extensive program. This is something that we are working for. Uh, but uh, we thought that uh, diversity um, can be a bad thing because uh, it makes uh, selection really very hard. So uh, we uh, sometimes uh, 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 so we decided to uh, okay. well, we, deci uh, we decided to organize our programming on a the a same um, basis. At present, we don't have our own online resource. We had a long uh, and hard time fighting with uh, the uh, technical capacities. Our uh, cinema. Uh, is uh, our cinema online cinema is free? You don't have to register. You you can just watch high quality documentary films. And now let us talk about uh, let us talk about the medium, uh, which has evolved over the past uh, several years, fairly seriously. So I would like to um, talk about some things that we have been, uh, that we have experimented with as we went. We tried to use our channel as a venue for major events, and we organized um, an, uh, 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 we uh, organized um, a retrospective uh, of Louise Bourgeois together with the Garage Museum in Moscow, uh, which was a major event in the, uh, on the Moscow's artistic scene. Our scene. Uh, we participated. Co -participated uh, on the uh, uh, co participated in the. Inter uh, in the educational program. Um, the Garage Museum was responsible for uh, the um, exhibition, and we showed the film uh, uh, with Louis, uh, Louis Bourgeois. And uh, so the TV channel was one of the venues for such a grand event. This is one of the uh, possibilities for um, updating, um, for making, uh, f f for offering a more up-to-date angle um, on a film. In Moscow, uh, we're soon um, opening a Goethe Trichter um, um, uh, exhibition. So uh, I uh, saw the film uh, Goethe Trichter painting. The uh, motion picture uh, was a bit too slow moving. They showed Richter 
uh, creating his works, but in the context uh, of our collaboration with uh, the uh, museum on the exhibition, when we make this event relevant, uh, showing this film on our TV channel will become uh, more interesting. It will attract the viewers uh, because it will be part of the viewers' context. We're very interested in such um, events and we would like to develop this uh, direction. Evelyn Scloriantis, we mentioned here today something that uh, surprises me is that the very medium, uh, the very format of uh, how uh, documentary, cinema, uh, documentary films are presented has changed, has evolved too. Sometimes uh, uh, Laurie Anderson, uh, Anderson's film premiered on our channel and before it was released in, this, uh, in cinemas. Uh, we talked about uh, the film about Ingrid Bergman, which was released earlier than uh, it was shown at the uh, Swedish uh, Film Festival. And this is fantastic. Uh, when I was uh, visiting the Berlin Film Festival, uh, the culinary uh, or the gastronomic film program uh, included the film My Perfect Storm. And uh, the uh, Berlin Festival um, took place at the same time uh, uh, when our film was, uh, or as our film was shown on our channel. And this is something that Soderbeck used to talk about uh, when he did this experimental project at the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, so he uh, wanted to release um, the film in the day-to-date -date, uh, uh, program, uh, releasing it uh, in cinemas, on VOD, uh, and on TV. And the uh, cinema unions um, uh, refused to uh, buy this film because it was destroying the whole concept of doing business. And now, uh, in the um, um, in the USA, uh, there are many films uh, that are released on VOD first before uh, being released in cinemas, um, and this shows that there is no real competition between these two formats because um, a film first released on VOD can be um, can become can be famous and successful. The film Death Punk and Chain opened uh, the uh, festival of documentary films in. Um, Moscow, and even though we're all dreaming about some documentary audience, it's very diverse, it's scattered. There are people who watch dogs on DVD, on VOD, uh, those who attend cinemas. Uh, very often they don't overlap. So this content can be interested to all of them. Uh, but they might not necessarily know it or be aware of it. So in our work, we try to one message across. There is this wonderful story, like Laurie Anderson, the films that the previous speaker loved, which is also an interesting example for the whole documentary industry. I saw it last year in Toronto, and it was a, a huge excess before, because the film had, uh, because the, uh, the film was presented in Venice. Uh, it went to Toronto, then uh, it was presented on the New York Festival. So uh, she uh, c collected the whole, um, the whole um, set of important festivals that there are, and when she was presenting the film in Toronto. She said uh, that a friend uh, came up to her and said, Laurie, why don't we make a film? Laurie said, I'm not a director. And the guy said, uh, you do what you usually do, only in the film context. And I thought that that was a fantastic example of a person who tries to tell a story, show a picture that is very precise, it's very accurate, true to life. So Lurie knows exactly what she wants to say. And this work is also a vivid example of an industry becoming a trap for uh, all people who work for it. 
all those funding models, distribution models. And even though uh, reality is fluid and flexible, where everything shifts, uh, the um, borderlines between uh, documentaries and uh, fiction are uh, becoming, again, more fluid and uh, flexible. And uh, uh, you uh, see documentary uh, documentaries moving into art and art moving into documentaries. So this fresh take on things is very important even uh, also for prom uh, for documentary promotion. Like the situation that we had with Conte uh, Nast, which started making documentary, creating documentary content. Any partner we're interested in is ready to participate, uh, to participate in such partnerships because uh, they understand that what we are doing is interesting for their target groups. I visited um, a festival in Malmo, Nordisk Panorama, uh, who started a new, they started a new project of short films. There is uh, this highly uh, inventive, uh, yeah, by the way, uh, we have uh, the curator of Nordisk Panorama setting here. Um, sometimes get very uh, um, uh, interesting uh, hybrids of uh, uh, documentaries and feature films, uh, we, and they collected distributors and sales agents uh, specializing in short films, and I was really impressed by the fact that each and every one of them said that 60% of what they distributed uh, were feature films, 30% animation, uh, animation films, and just nine uh, and just 10% were documentaries. And you don't think about it when uh, you watch transparency videos on Facebook, which can be based on texts on whole stories, when there are resources um, that are launched specifically for uh, spreading uh, documentary content, when uh, there is Times and there is Guardian that produce uh, documentary content. All of them have the audiences. There is New York and uh, New York Times and New Yorker spending huge sums of money making do for making documentary films. And uh, there are really highly professional photographers and directors creating documentaries. But New York Times is a medium. They don't have the instruments to sell these films. Short dogs are um, another field that uh, we specialize in because we collaborate with a number of companies and buy films uh, made for New York Times and for Guardians, for The Guardian. Uh, and uh, this can be uh, works about, say, people who <coughs> volunteered to go to, uh, to Mars and, uh, and knowing that this was going to be a one-way trip and why they decided to do that. And uh, also, we had a film about a personal tragic, uh, about uh, films about based on personal tragic stories, and the films lasting three or four minutes. And I think that such uh, things, such established methods that uh, exist in an industry, might uh, act as barriers to uh, dissemination of films. As a TV channel, we also do our own production projects, and our content, of course, is primarily documentaries, and uh, we, what you see here is uh, the Promise Steel by Alona Smirnova, sitting here in the audience. It's a two part um, series, TV series about the making of documentary 
films, documentary filmmaking in uh, uh, Russia. It began in St. Petersburg and uh, ended uh, somewhere beyond the Polar Circle in Buryatia, Yakutia, uh, territories in the far north uh, of Russia. And uh, the protagonist is a woman, not very typical for the documentary film world, because uh, typically uh, uh, it's the female directors that suffer from the documentary film system most. And uh, we also uh, made a series of 10-minute interviews as part of our New Year project, because uh, when uh, you um, summarize what you have achieved over the year, uh, you uh, very often get the, uh, you, uh, in newspapers, for example, you get the whole list, 20 films of, say, 2015 or 2014 uh, uh, that uh, the viewers like best. And uh, we did this kind of uh, summary um, program, end of year program, uh, a film plus a 10-minute interview with some speaker who can provide more details about this film or a new angle on that film, thereby putting the film into some context, uh, drawing people's attention to the fact that the films um, do not exist in a vacuum. There is always a context. And there are always links between uh, documentaries. OK, that's uh, another important item on our agenda. When uh, we were rebranding um, our uh, channel, uh, we thought about the differences between documentaries and feature films, uh, and uh, in feature films there are always fr uh, frames um, with polygraphic extension, and uh, these stills are um, one of the uh, one of the key promotion instruments. In documentary uh, films, uh, the situation is much uh, worse. For example, uh, even the primary. Uh, um, yes, sometimes uh, you take um, stills from the films that um, do not look good on posters. And I started my personal project trying to enliven the situation in uh, with documentaries and posters a bit. And And together with my friend from Stockholm, uh, Martin, uh, Martin Falk, um, we were invited to the Modern Art Museum in Glasgow that uh, did an exhibition by uh, John Sampson, uh, also a documentary maker. And uh, he, was, uh, he was famous uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, he was famous for the Dressing for Pleasure film. That was one of the most quoted um, British films of the 1970s uh, because it featured the sex uh, shop opened by Vivian, uh, Vivian Westwood and Lauren uh, McLaren. Um, this director um, always made films about uh, about marginalized uh, populations, such as uh, the people who covered their bodies um, completely with tattoos. And uh, the museum uh, did a series of posters, and we researched the context uh, uh, where John Sampson worked, and we collected a large amount of visual information that we uh, could present in this format. And I think it was a very daring project for a Glasgow, uh, for the Glasgow Museum in the context of promotion of documentary films, when there are 
many resources to create a story, to create a retrospective, which would uh, be more visually challenging. The visual part is uh, what we are trying to do. However, it's not as complex as it seems because our channel has six staff workers and uh, the distribution, the support of festivals and marketing. The whole of the system uh, is geared, is focused on the film. The film is key. And I would like to um, finish by this, uh, and I would like to uh, encourage you to watch our 24 Doc channel. Thank you very much. Uh, to start off with a question from me, you mentioned the online cinema is free, and you were giving films for free to festivals. So how do, how do you make money? But this is the thing, you know. It's um, should I answer in English? Uh, up to you. Well, what happens? And the distribution is marketing for us. It's very important. When I talk about integration, about the fact that the industry has to develop, has to move further, has to change the models that exist now, because now the distribution of documentaries in Russia is really not a commercial story, it's not commercial. Well, we can afford that, because the important thing for us is to promote our brand name. So the audience watches the films, they understand who we are, what our brand is. For us, it's very important to be online, to have online content, because our audience, first of all, gets to us through internet, online. You have the smart TV and some other stuff, but still watching films on TV is kind of you know, old. Whereas the steps towards innovation is always a good thing, even when they take a lot of time and a lot of resources. And a lot of the times it doesn't cost much more to get the television rates. But what's important for us to be open for the audience. So you make a step towards the audience. You are saying we have great films, we have beautiful films. Come watch us. But this is not the only thing. We have more films. This is our channel. It's open for you. And it's the same with festivals. We offer films to festivals for free. And we offered even the Danish film, that you might know, also for free. And we screened, them in, screened that film in Planetarium. So in some sense, festival becomes your informational sponsor. So if you have 10, 15 festivals a year, that's a marketing tool for us. And so if our format is right for the festival, it's good for us. I mean, we're buying only television rights, for example, but we need to support the film. We know that later on maybe we will, sh we will be showing this film on our channel. Important thing for us um, in the end is information, giving out the information, because we have a lot of films that we show earlier than they are released. I mean, these are great films. Just so the media instrument is kind of limited instrument. It's not possible to cover everything that is released. So, and I am trying to communicate to the audience with the tools that I have what, what is being screened on our channel. And everything is connected to some inner processes, everything is more complicated, so we need to give out the information. And can you say a bit more about how you, you work with documentaries? Do you 
co-produce? Do you pre-buy or do you only acquire films? Uh, <coughs> so there is a very important moment. The system of producing a film is built the following way. It's built in such a way that it becomes not profitable to buy the film that is being produced. So a lot of the times it's better just to buy the work when it's done, when it's finished. So if you think about the commercial standpoint, maybe it doesn't make sense to buy the film when it's not finished to co-produce. But we're open to everything. We're open to any offers. And I'm thinking now about the Russian film. And the editor of that film is in the audience with us, listening to me, just silent, doesn't want to talk about that. But anyway, the point is that we're involved in all sorts of processes, in the processes in all the st different stages. Important thing is, if we like the project, we think we want to buy the project, but we always have to remember that the industry is ba is created in such a way that, I mean, maybe we're not ready to pay a lot of money for the film. No, this is a commercial secret. It's a really secret. That's how it works. But we know it's not a lot of money. So it's on our common interest to make it so that the system functions better and cinematographers could have a chance to open and to be more successful. Do we have some comments? Do you have a question? Thank you for being such a film buff. I can hear you. You're really uh, well informed about what, what is going on. Um, and for me, many of the things that you're showing there, it, it, more, it, it, it seems like an art channel also, in a way. So I don't understand the word when you are saying it's an educational channel. Can you, can you uh, enlighten me? No, it's not an art channel. What I was showing you is just our mid-programming formation. Well, that's not only our channel, it's, it's a marketing thing, that what you saw. It is a channel that shows documentary films. I know that in Sweden, you have Fire in the Sea being screened. We have it also on our channel next week, Fire in the Sea. You turn on the channel, and you have to be interested by what you see. That way you stay with us. So how our marketing tool, we lure you, we're trying to show something unusual, something exciting, so we get your feelings with us and you come to us and then later show you the films. What is the average viewer, what is the profile of the average viewer? Age-wise, male, female, what, what would you say? Well, um, it's 50-50, men and women, uh, but uh, 35 plus, uh, men, men 25 plus and women, mm, maybe 35 plus, average is 35 plus, I think. But the data that we have, it's only about Russia, and you know, people watch us not only in Russia, we're also in the other countries where we don't really have the stats. And looking at the social networks, the viewers are very different, various, from 20 till, for, till very old, I don't know. No subtitles? When we talk about Laurie Anderson, Lloyd Dreams said, he said, her voice is the music in the film. So, of course, we had subtitles. But unfortunately, our audience doesn't know foreign language, so sometimes we dub. We have to dub. And you're running in loops, I suppose, yes? 
So how many times can one film be screened on, on 24 dogs? Um, no. Formally, technically, every day. Four hours for opening night for premiere. A technical film is repeated, I think, 12 times. It doesn't, it is not as horrible as it sounds. Because during the day, you do not repeat the, the same film in one day. And you can see about like 10 documentaries, various documentaries during one day. It can repeat every now and then, of course, the same film, because that's how the system works. On HBO, it's the same, I think. Do we have some more comments or questions from the room? No, we can finish. Or maybe we can just ask your colleague also to say a little word. Uh, you're the editor-in-chief. Um, can you tell us a bit more also about the, the programming and the selection of films? I think Alexis said more than I ever can add. The only thing that I want to add is that we're still waiting and we're hoping that Russian documentary professionals will start making really great documentary films and then we'll be able to show it in, the, in our channel. We have a very big holding and then uh, the technical requirements are more severe now. Well, we had a lot of films ready to screen, but about 70% from that roughly we had to reject because of the technical requirements. So I'm really asking the Russian documentary, documentary professionals, please make good films because we're going to show them. Thank you very much. Okay, very interesting, very energetic. I don't know how many 100% uh, documentary channels are in the world. Maybe you know that, Alexei. What? How many documentary channels only showing documentaries are there in the world? No, uh, I mean, there's, there, there's there American? are uh, a lot, but uh. usually they diverse them them thematically, okay. or they usually have like a big percentage of like local docs, like Yes Doku in Israel. Okay. But, and Chinese, you know, but uh. I mean, um, the thing is that actually, as we can see from the numbers, the strategy mm -hmm. which we took is actually the right one because all the numbers are growing pretty much every month. So right. I hope it will only get better. Okay, good.